I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, joining the show, uh, long overdue here at I Mix What I Like, are Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier, both of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Brian Becker is the national coordinator of the Answer Coalition and is a founder and central organizer for the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And Eugene Perrier is a founding member of the Party for Social Liber- Socialism and Liberation and is on the editorial board of Liberation News. Welcome to the both of you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. So I wanted to have you both on. I mean, for, for a long time, frankly, I've known of your work. I followed both of your work, uh, have even been in some similar actions, even, uh, you know, indirectly with the both of you uh, and have uh, greatly appreciated that work uh, and wanted to have you on because I think as you are both well aware, not only is there not a, not only is there a need for revolutionary political organization and activity, but there's a great need for, I think, a, a frank conversation, a somewhat extended conversation about just what is socialism. Uh, I think that it doesn't get enough of an accurate and honest run in, in our conversations. A lot of people have conversations and even arguments about it and don't really, I think, understand what it is that they're talking about. And certainly there's very little done, obviously, in the mainstream media, but I think also in alternative media spaces to make clear just what is socialism and to give it room for uh, adequate conversation and in- inclusion. So, Brian, if I could start with you, what is the Party for Socialism and Liberation? And then how do you all deploy this thing called socialism? How do you define it and how does it uh, show up in your work? Uh, sure. The Party for Socialism and Liberation, PSL, has chapters in about 25 cities now. It's been around for 10 years. We have hundreds of activists and core members uh, all over the country who have been Uh, key players in the anti-war movement, the struggle against police murder and police uh, racist violence in support of immigrant rights and support of women's rights, the LGBT movement, uh, workplace organizing. Uh, We're an activist party, but we're uh, we're a Marxist party as well. So we're not just activists. We're also guided by a Marxist world framework, a a worldview. And we are um, ardent supporters of the core demand, which is the, the reorganization of capitalist society on, along the lines of socialist principles. And what we mean by socialism is to take, uh, in, in short term, to take the vast wealth that exists in society that's been created by the labor of working people, that has been privately appropriated by corporations, and thus enriching a small part of the population, the 1% or the 0.1 of the 1%, and instead of having those people control the wealth, to take that wealth, the wealth created again by the labor of the social labor of working people, and use that money to provide basic guaranteed rights for every human being, meaning the right to a, a decent paying job, the recent the, the, the right to free health care, the right to free education, uh, the right to uh, affordable housing. In other words, the basic things in life, that which is needed to sustain life, should be a constitutional legal right uh, guaranteed to every person in the country, every person born, and that that wealth should, t- should be taken, should be re-expropriated uh, from the capitalist class that lives with great fortune off of the labor of workers. Now, you take, just to give you a, one quick example, uh, you take the Walton family that owns Walmart, Walton family has the equivalent wealth of 41% of the American people, 41% of the entire population. (laughs) And the Walmart workers, the ones who actually do the work and generate the profits, generate the income and thus the profits for that family, they are so poorly paid that they're all eligible for public assistance. They can't feed their families. So we're saying instead of Walmart family owning and expropriating the wealth, from Walmart stores, those, those stores and all other means of production should be nationalized, should be turned into public property, and the profits should be used for the benefit of working people rather than uh, the small capitalist class. That's the essence of what we mean by socialism. It's returning the human family to where we were for 95% of our existence as a species, which was living in cooperation with communal property. Uh, it's only in the last few thousand years that the human family's existence has been, I would say, perverted by the existence of private property, 
private ownership and thus great inequality. So we're talking with Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, Brian, before we move on, I, I also wanted to ask you, what is, you know, from the time that I came back into the D.C. area uh, uh, in the early 2000s and became, you know, somewhat active in the area, the Answer Coalition uh, had a, uh, at least since that time that I'm aware of, had a prominent position and role in radical activist struggle. Um, quite frankly, a lot of the things that I heard, you know, when I first came back around, you, you were not necessarily positive and people were afraid to, to function with and work with the Answer Coalition. But one of the things that I think I, I discovered later was one of the problems that folks had was, was really a competitive one with the level of organization you all reached, that the, your presence, your ability to bring, bring out a crowd uh, I think, I, and I, I'm, this is not a scientific, uh, you know, conclusion I've reached, but but I think had a lot to do with with people's uh, frustration with their own inability to organize at that level. Could you just tell us a little bit about the Answer Coalition and how it does or does not differ from PSL, uh, and uh, um, and maybe a little bit about how you have, uh, I'm sure, dealt with, or, you know, been aware of and dealt with. Uh, you know, um, so-called movement critiques of that organization or that coalition? Sure. The, the Answer Coalition uh, started three days after September 11th. On September 14th, 2001, when George W. Bush's approval rating was 95%, when the country was, you know, gripped by fear and rage, and there was the beginning of what we knew to be a, a, a worldwide war drive by Bush and Cheney cynically using the grief and anger of people after September 11th for, for an imperial war drive. Three days after that event, we said, let's go into the streets and organize a demonstration that says war is not the answer. Those are very difficult times, as you remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And under those circumstances, everybody, all of the liberals basically uh, condemned us, or many of them, for uh, demonstrating when it was inappropriate. And that's when answer first got its bad rap from some sectors of the liberal uh, milieu. But we went ahead and we organized 25,000 people on September uh, 29th, 18 days after September 11th, and we began the fight back. We began the anti-war movement. And then we had huge demonstrations, the largest ever in April 2002 when Israel reinv reinvaded the West Bank. We had 100,000 people out for Palestine, the biggest demonstration in American history. And then we started the mass demonstrations against the Iraq war, and we had hundreds of thousands of people month after month. Um, we were condemned by some sectors of the liberal movement because we were very close allies with the Palestinian community, which was at that time uh, sort of considered a taboo subject amongst the American left. Uh, we were very strong in terms of elevating the struggle against racism and not just making it a, quote, peace uh, movement that would be predominantly middle class white people. Uh, we were criticized for that. And of course, as you mentioned, then there's just territorial or ridiculous competitive uh, things that come up between groups. Of course, some of that happened too. But I think what, what's been noteworthy about the Answer Coalition is we have brought prof a professional level of organization into a volunteer movement. We've used professional standards for organizing. And at the same time, we've been inclusive, meaning we never kept any sector of society out because it was considered to be alienating to somebody else. So we said uh, we want the black and Latino and Asian and Arab uh, and progressive whites to work together. We want gay and straight people to work together. We want to be with the undocumented community when some of the peace movement said, well, that's not an anti-war issue. We've had a position of uniting as many people as possible so that we can fight for each other and with each other. Uh, it was a different sort of political message and, I, and something that I think big parts of the peace movement uh, who wanted to make peace be a single issue, peace being the absence of war, uh, peace being when only Americans die. In other words, that sector of the movement that was sort of uh, tied to an old view, uh, they criticized us, but that goes with the territory. Eugene Perrier, uh, again, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And look, I don't mean to do what I think often happens in these kinds of conversations or in these kinds of uh, 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 you know, even organizational spaces, that is to reduce you to the race guy in this in this socialist <laughs> conversation. 
but I mean, this is this is as, as you know, we've talked uh, uh, you know publicly, privately about this for, for on and off for a number of years now. This is this is something that is uh, a, a major concern for for me. I think for some of the listeners to to this program, this issue of race versus class, and I've admitted, I continue to admit that for whatever it may be as a flaw analytically, I am a race first person. I, I feel as though, uh, I do feel it very personally as, as someone that has been uh, uh, in some ways beaten down by race and white supremacy to the point where I can't see past that as a primary starting point for organization, uh, for political struggle and so on. That is the national question for the before the class question uh, is, is is for me primary. Um, how do you work within or deal with these questions? Or how does the PSL deal with these kinds of questions? Or how do you interpret socialism itself uh, uh, as an answer to this these kinds of questions about race versus class? Um, and then the ability to to interracially organize and work collectively uh, along the lines that Brian has just described. No, I mean, I think that for sure it, it's it's a key question, and in some ways, it's it's a great question even beyond the particular issue because it speaks so much to, in my view, sort of you know some of the broader sort of theoretical misconceptions about socialism, Marxism, <laughs> communism, whatever it may be, and you know I I think that in a way you're right, right? I mean, because the way I look at it is the national question, it is a class question in its own right, but you have to look at the issue of quote-unquote class in a way that's not reductionist because i think so often the way it's presented is sort of like is it race first is it class first which i actually think is sort of historically limiting talking about maybe a couple hundred years of, of american history but i think if we understand the reality of world history and our particularities we can get a little bit of what we're getting at i mean certainly and as as you know very very well, Jared, I don't have to tell you. I mean, there's long histories, of course, over thousands of years of different forms of of, of difference and and you know in a positive and a negative way, from a xenophobic way to a positive way. I mean, obviously, you know, in the the Afrocentric tradition, we know quite a bit about this from the, that sort of historiography and and uh, Black Athena. They came before Columbus. You know, some of the different interactions that have happened between peoples that have been both positive and negative, but certainly not. Uh, of, a, of, of the particularity of which we see, which is the racism, racial discrimination, national oppression of people of African descent here in the United States and to, you know, really a lot of degrees, the broader diaspora, which relates very specifically to the rise of class society in its earliest days from absolutist feudalism to the earliest days of capitalism, whereby this system of global white supremacy, whereby white as a normative value was constructed as a generalized positive thing and black African sin as a generalized negative thing. And I was, I would actually say people who are really interested in this, you should read, uh, you know, Robin Blackburn's book about the making of new world slavery, which talks about this very interesting and the, the hermetic myth and how it came to be. But the ultimate point being is wrapped up deeply in the development of capitalism as a system and later of imperialism as a system and the need to create these racial categories as, you know, not elements to divide in a crude way workers from each other, although it does certainly play that role, but ultimately as an integral part of building up this system of abstracting a certain amount of wealth from these oppressed nations, including what we believe in the PSL to be an oppressed nation of African Americans here in the United States to allow it to reach this level. And so from that point of view, I view the thing is oftentimes a straw man, sort of the race versus class question when you understand the operation of race in our broader sort of world history as a function of a rising system that was more than willing to deploy these forms of degradation, genocide, slavery, uh, and, and oppression through the years to secure its own sort of profit system. And, and you can say whatever you want to say about whether or not it was necessary, unnecessary, it is what it is. But the point being, it's what happened historically. And that when we understand it like that, and this certainly was the point that Lenin was making when he modified workers of the world unite to workers and oppressed people of the world unite, that ultimately the enemy of the oppressed nations of the world and of the working classes of the world uh, is the same, the imperialist ruling class that is attempting to use the exploitation of workers as workers, in addition to the exploitation of nations outside of the imperialist core to maintain its power and its wealth and its ability to survive as a system, then you see that there's a synergy between the two struggles. And even to the degree that 
you know, the goals have some level of difference. I mean, a national liberation struggle is striving for freedom, right? And freedom can have sort of like a basic legal democratic definition, but it also has a deeper definition as we've recognized in the black liberation movement in America, whereby when you have legal freedom, uh, you know, it's somewhat hollow and you need something more, more deep, social, economic, cultural freedom. Then again, it speaks to the same issue of the same enemy, of the same struggle, of the unity between the two struggles, which is why I would say when we look around the world, so many national liberation struggles in Africa, in South America, in the United States that have been waged by black people. National liberation struggles have been led by and waged by socialists and communists. So that's a little bit of a roundabout answer, but essentially I think that's how we approach it and how we deal with it is not really by separating the two questions as race versus class, but by integrating in this analysis of the particularity of white supremacy, particularly as it confronts Afro-descendant people around the world as being concomitant with the rise of capitalism and imperialism and having sort of a, a normative function in there. All right, good people, you're listening to our Mix What I Like for imixwhatilike.org and WPFW 89.3 FM. Shout out also to rapstation.com, imixwhatilike at gmail.com for more, for if you want to contact the show and then be in, in, in communication with us, imixwhatilike.org for more information on this show and more. And at imixwhatilike at all your relevant social media where you can be in touch with us as well. We're going to take a quick break and come right back with more from Eugene Perrier and Brian Becker of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Don't go anywhere. Much more coming up right here. A Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. Peace, everybody. Back in a minute. All right, welcome back once again to our Mix What I Like here, WPFW 89.3 FM. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be here with you. Doctors Hate and Todd Stephen Burroughs are out handling the people's business. And we're offering you a pre recorded conversation that we were able to conduct a couple of days ago with the good folks at the Party for Socialism and Liberation, Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier. Uh, Brian, let me bring you back into the conversation and give you a chance also to respond to that previous question. I don't want to do the same thing in reverse, that is to suggest that as the white guy, you can't talk about race. And I know that uh, <laughs> you, you're adept at doing so and have uh, built with a lot of people uh, from a lot of different parts of the world. And, and, and as you said, have made that a core uh, issue of concern and focus in your organizing. Um, Please, if you have any comments that you want to add to that last question about race versus class and how that interacts with your work, uh, please offer them. Yeah, I think we can see from the recent developments following the, the murder of Mike Brown uh, in, in Ferguson, uh, the murder of Eric Garner, the murder of Tamir Rice, the murder earlier of a 13-year-old Andy Lopez, uh, the, the murder of John Crawford at the, in the Walmart store in, in Ohio. The movement that has grown up around these police killings, which are habitual, routine police killings that are now being exposed but have been going on day in and day out, that movement has drawn a line again in the United States between those who are standing against racism and those who are standing with racism. And all of the people who are supporting Darren Wilson or supporting the NYPD or the police in general, and that's a very significant part of the white population, those people are doing so because of the function of white supremacy and racism. Even though they may be working class people, even though they may be oppressed people, even though they may themselves be suffering from low wages, the only reason they're standing with the cops, if they are today, is because of white racism and the function of white supremacy. So as revolutionary socialists, as communists, as those who are seeking to build multinational unity against the 1% or the 0.1 of the 1%, those who are the real power, the racist ruling class in America, we can't really build multinational unity without putting the struggle against white supremacy at the very center of our activity. And so you see, we are, for us, we consider the struggle against white supremacy and racism to be the leading and most significant part of America's class struggle. Because you can see this has been the fault line uh, for capitalist rule, as Eugene said, you know, for the past 400 years, uh, since this social system was implanted on the, the, the soil of the indigenous peoples of North America by uh, European monarchs and, and those who they deeded the land to, this, function, this system of capitalism has, been grow has grown up in parallel as a, as a method both of class domination and for the extraction of super profits 
by the capitalist establishment, and it's left a big impact on big parts of the white population. So we as revolutionaries are organizing against the capitalist class and in support of higher wages and affordable housing and free health care and free education, but also doing that with the full recognition that we have to make this struggle against white supremacy and every manifestation of racism as a principal part of our struggle. And there are a lot of white people, I want to say, who are also coming out and standing uh, with the black community right now as it mobilizes in a, cent in a central way. Uh, it's not the majority of the white population, but, you know, millions of white people want to fight racism. They want to be against the racist ruling class. They are, as we can see from the reemergence of what is largely a black led movement in the last couple of months, uh, willing to and excited about the fact that there can be African or African-American leadership for a broad social movement that they'll be part of as happened to a considerable degree in the 60s. In other words, there's reasons for hope and optimism that in spite of the awful legacy of and backwardness of white supremacy within significant portions of the white working class and middle class population, that the struggle against racism can inspire millions of people of all races and nationalities to, to join together. So we consider it to be pivotal in terms of the class struggle in the United States. That again, folks, is Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier of the Party for Socialism and Liberation joining us here at I Mix What I Like on WPFW 89.3 FM. You know, gentlemen, a couple, some years ago, there was uh, an attempt made, I think, um, you know, a little attempt made by the folks at the Revolution, Revolutionary Communist Party to recruit me to be more involved with them. And I, and I wanted to ask you one more question along these lines of race versus class, uh, because my response to them I mean, I, I frankly, you know, frankly, I admitted that one of my my, my biggest obstacles was that was was uh, joining an organization led by another white guy who, um, at least at the time, I'm not sure of his current status, was somewhere off hiding in the world for reasons that I wasn't really clear on. And I don't mean to, to take shots at Bob Bavaki, and I don't know enough about his history to, to do that. But that was just my, my initial general response. But then more more to the substance of it was that uh, was the same question about the the. Uh, the place that certain revolutionary thinkers have in sort of the pantheon of, of, of radical thought. So obviously in terms of socialism and communism, you've both mentioned Marx and Lenin. Um, and my question for this one person, uh, uh, you know, making this effort to bring me into the organization was where do you all place other people that I hold in, in even greater esteem, for instance, uh, uh, Franz Fanon, uh, Claudia Jones, and even more specifically, Kwame Nkrumah and Kwame Ture, formerly uh, known as Stokely Carmichael, and their application of, of scientific socialism under, you know, a United States of Africa. Again, the national question first, a race of race first uh, approach, but also one that deeply infused and borrowed from and extended uh, even the work of, of Marx and Lenin and Mao. Um, how uh, Eugene, I'll start with you. Where do I don't know. How does that question or how mm -hmm. do you all respond to that that question or to those thinkers or their their place in this history of, of, of ideas? Well, I would say very high. I mean, certainly one of the number one articles that I use a lot of times when we're discussing issues of, you know, socialism in the African diaspora with individuals, uh, you know, comrades in the party and, and friends of ours is actually in Kruma's piece on African socialism which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. It's mm -hmm. sort of a polemic essentially against Julius Nyeri and, and some of the quote unquote African socialists who exist and making a number of the points about the importance of scientific rootedness, also making some, I think, very clarifying points regarding. Right. Uh, that there is uh, no there is no African socialism. There's just socialism. Right. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And also sort of trying to dismiss. I think he even calls them some of the fairy tale visions of right. Africa and right. things like that, which I think is 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 extremely useful from a lot of different perspectives, even out outside of just the African continent, uh, and certainly, you know, Fanon and, and others who can't be denied because ultimately Walter Rodney, I mean, you know, I won't go right, on and right, on all right. day because we could go on and on all day because, you know, similar to what I was saying towards the end of my last comments, I think what we've seen is that so much of the national liberation praxis, if you will, to sound a little academic, uh, in the, in, in the African world, although the same can be said in, in other nations and in continents and areas as well, have been 
coming from people who are deeply infused with the concept of, you know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, sort of a, some people would call it sort of like a Marxist analysis. I mean, I would say it speaks to sort of the universality of scientific exploration from sort of a materialist perspective in the world, which I think is essentially the basic point that Marx was trying to make. And I think it's the sort of the point that Nkrumah gets at also in the early first chapter, I believe it is, or maybe the introduction to neo-colonialism, where he's talking about the sort of the place of the Russian revolution in history and understanding it, is it's not so much about, you know, certain individuals explicating certain things, whether they were the ones who did it or did not, but the fact that these experiences arise out of a certain reality. I know Amakar Cabral and his weapon of theory speaks very heavily right. to this when he describes what is a revolution, which is certainly a materialist conception, but he just breaks it down in his own words. But I think it speaks to the general universality whereby, you know, it, some people read Marx and Lenin like they are sacred text. Uh, and that's fine, I, I guess, to some degree, although I don't agree with it. Uh, but from our perspective, they are guiding texts that speak to a certain method, which makes it easy for people of any and all backgrounds, regardless of the particular focus of what they may be doing, to embrace these sort of general assumptions and push them forward. So, I mean, from, I think from our perspective, we're not trying to create some sort of pantheon uh, so much as we're speaking to, to the method that was originally explicated by, you know, in our view, not maybe originally isn't really the word, but you know what I'm saying? That sort of was systematized uh, uh, by individuals like Marx and Lenin, but certainly is not exclusionary of many, many other very important thinkers. I think it's less about a pantheon and more about a method, I guess, is the real answer. And, and you know, and, and before I come back to you, Brian, you know, Eugene, how do you answer this question of uh, uh, socialism being Eurocentric and therefore of little value to African descended people or other groups of people who have their own histories and own trajectories and own cultural norms and values that, of course, Marx knew very little about? I mean, he was clearly no expert on the African world. Uh, or the thoughts that predate his own or, or the versions of, of, of social organization that pre predate the one that, with which he was most familiar. How, how do you address that? Because I always go back to that, that, that not famous enough to me debate between Malefi Asante and Kwame Ture in 1996, where, where this question of, 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 from Asante and that wing of the Afrocentric camp says, you know, that, that socialism is of no value because it is, it is Eurocentric and therefore anti African, antithetical to African beliefs and values, etc., and cannot have any solutions or answers for that that population or th that community of people. Uh, do you have a particular way of addressing that question? I do. I mean, I think that you know, ultimately, it, it, it's a question that is based on. Well, let me put it to you like this: the direct way I do it, and you know, certainly the way that uh, I thought Kwame Ture pretty excellently put it forward was, you know, the real question is how you're going to organize your your future society. Uh, which is what you're consistently evading, and that's why I'm for socialism because it's a you know the communal way of organizing society, meeting people's needs, and so on and so forth. But I will say this: that I think that ultimately, when we look at this issue, I mean, materialism as a concept, first of all, I, I don't know of anyone who ever really claimed that Marx invented that, including himself, uh, and, and right, when he discusses right. the things he put forward. But that ultimately. He was analyzing the capitalist system in its germ, in the place it was created. And we cannot deny that it's the system of capitalism, imperialism that has gone all over the world and oppressed all of these individuals. And if we're trying to, trying to understand the systems of oppression under which we are working, I mean, whatever goal you're saying, OK, I want to construct a society that in the future is based around this sort of ontological concept. The key issue that exists right now is overthrowing the system of oppression that allows no other uh, no other alternatives, however you may determine them, to exist that could potentially challenge its power. Then you have to recognize that analyzing those systems of oppression and understanding their evolution and really how they evolved in their purest, most rooted form, which was in Western Europe, uh, which obviously you know is certainly no great historical fill up to them per se. But ultimately, that uh, understanding this is is what sort of is Marx's main contribution, which I think is is the key factor. But the sort of the broader concepts and realities, I don't think anyone was ever claiming that these things didn't exist by other people in all parts of the world, including Europe, including himself, but the particularity of capitalism as a system, which as an imperialist system and now sort of uh, over uh, uh, overstands, if I can use that, uh, or over uh, mm -hmm. overhangs mm -hmm. 
the, the, the entire systems of oppression we all deal with on a daily basis requires that kind of analysis to get to the root of what it is. Because if you don't know what you're fighting, you can't, you certainly cannot be, uh, you know, successful against yeah, it. Yeah, and, and I've always thought it was amazing. To, it was just so, it still is a shock to me to hear anyone refer to Kwame Ture as do, involving himself in anything that's Eurocentric as, 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 uh, um, uh, you know, he was willing to be in solidarity with anyone, but he was clearly, you know, uh, concerned with African people primarily. And that, so in that debate, it was also interesting just to see him a- accused of that. And also then his part of his response that I, I always also liked was was this this point about, uh, you know, no more than than uh, Isaac Newton gave, uh, you know, invented gravity. He just he just identified the pre-existing natural laws that in the same way that Marx identified pre-existing natural laws in terms of social organization and distribution of what society produces. Um, anyway, I just, you know, so uh, uh, let's take another quick break here at I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM, I Mix What I Like dot org for more. And then we'll come back in just a moment with more about the Party for Socialism and Liberation with Eugene Perrier and Brian Becker. All right, welcome back, everybody. More I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. Again, I'm Jared Ball, happy to be your host, having this what I think is an overdue and very important conversation with Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier, key organizers and activists within the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Before we move on, I want to give a shout out to your your comrade Ernesto Aguilar, uh, who we had hoped and in, in, in will endeavor again to bring onto this program, but someone who uh, runs the Liberation uh, Radio for the PSL, uh, liberationnews.org, uh, right? I believe that's the website, right? Do I have that correct? Fellas. liberationnews.org is yeah the our companion website and liberationradio.org for the show right okay great great uh, uh but shout out to ernesto he's been very helpful uh not only in terms of of my own work and uh you know directly <laughs> helpful and, uh, and i want to pr- thank him for that publicly but also just inspirational in terms mm-hmm. of the radio work he produces each and every week uh, and similarly, before we move on, I also want to just give you all a chance because I know one of the first cri- criticisms, I think valid criticisms that I that I will get after this program uh, is where are the sisters, where are the women. And I know that the, the PSL uh, is, is, is it, despite this conversation being, you know, exceedingly fallow centric is not one <laughs> to be uh, um, discriminatory against women. And forgive me for I'll take the blame for the arrangement that there were no women involved in this conversation. But um, I know that you all have a, a lot of strong uh, women leadership and activists and organizers and, and uh, 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 contributors to your organization. Uh, and in a moment when I ask you about electoral politics, you've also had uh, um, uh, many women run for positions uh, politically and represent your organization in those spaces as well. Uh, but Brian, I wanted to also give you a chance to respond to that last question. If you had any, any thoughts you wanted to add to that, uh, um, that, that question of the role of where some of these key thinkers are, uh, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that as well. Sure. I, I think that for us in the party for socialism and liberation, we, we study Marx and we study Lenin and Engels and the, you know, the great thinkers who helped create some, what's called scientific socialism. But we also study Walter Rodney. We also study Amakar Cabral. Uh, we also s- study Samora Michel from Mozambique. Right, right, right. Uh, in other words, we have been able to ascertain and gain the theoretical political contributions from revolutionaries all over the world. And the, the fact of the matter is that while Marxism first took root where capitalism took root in, in, in Europe, once you see the end of World War II, the whole thrust of global Marxism shifts dramatically to the East and to the South. And so the world was shaped and then reshaped after World War II in, a, in what is called the Cold War, but what was really uh, a war by imperialism trying to, what they call contain communism, but what they were really trying to contain was the struggle for national liberation and independence in the colonized world or the semi-colonized world. And those struggles were, to the extent that they were very revolutionary, led by the communist parties of Korea and China and Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. And that uh, sweep also went to the Middle East. So you see the Iraqi revolution in 1958, largely led by the Iraqi Communist Party. It was the communists in Egypt and the communists in Syria, uh, along with bourgeois nationalist forces who were anti-imperialist, who overthrew colonial rule uh, in the Middle East. And then we have 
uh, Nkrumah in Africa. We have the great thrust of the African Revolution that, as, as we know, uh, spread everywhere in South Africa, the South African Communist Party in Angola, in Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, in Ethiopia, which had a communist-led uh, revolution first in 1974 and then a, a, a further departure to the left under Mengistu in 77. Uh, and then you have Latin America, where you have Fidel and the Latin American revolutionaries taking up the banner uh, in, in, in Chile, in Argentina, everywhere. So Marxism really migrated to where the center of gravity for revolutionary politics went. It was no longer Europe. It wasn't North America. It was really what was historically called the so-called third world, the colonized and semi-colonized world. And so Marxism uh, is no longer even remotely European. The, the European left is largely uh, dwindled. It's, it's small compared to what's going on in the other parts of the world. And here in the United States, uh, we believe that the sector of the U.S. working class population, the most oppressed sectors, uh, predominantly in the African American community, will be the leaders, will be the, the social human beings, the, the social uh, grouping that has the greatest part of the leadership for the class struggle in the United States, as we are observing even right today. So uh, we, we have to study and do study all of the revolutionary thinkings and contributions most of which is coming, as I said, in the past 70 years, not from Europe or North America at all. That again is Brian Becker and his comrade Eugene Perrier joining us here at I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM, I Mix What I Like dot org as well. They, of course, can be reached at liberationradio.org and liberationnews.org uh, for more information on the work with, uh, with their organization. Uh, um, as well. Gentlemen, again, a lot of times people hear the word socialism and communism and, and to a lesser degree, historical or dialectical materialism. Could you both give, Brian, I'll start with you, uh, um, a very you know quick summary of what all that means. Just again, I know you, you mentioned socialism earlier and defined that a little bit, but when you say communism and then historical and dialectical materialism, just for those who, who may be hearing these conversations for the first time, what, what do those things mean and how do you use them in your work? We mean by socialism the first stage after capitalism in a post-capitalist uh, transitional society on the road to communism. And what socialism would do would be to nationalize, take over, and make public the privately held means of production, meaning the biggest banks, and the biggest corporations and putting them under social popular democratic control and taking the wealth and assets of the capitalist class and the corporations and banks uh, and using those to meet society's basic needs and the needs of all people. And so the first step in a socialist society would be to change the American Constitution, which was you know, drafted by slave owners and capitalist merchants. Uh, 200 and so 220 years ago, and making a new constitution written by and for working people and poor people in the United States, which would mean a job as a as a guaranteed legal and human right, a job, a decent paying job, free education, free housing, and affordable housing. Uh, those would be instant first step demands for socialism. Communism, in the in the conception of Marxism, means the withering away of old social socially coercive institutions like the police, the courts, the prisons, and by virtue of the creation of a surplus product in such plentiful quantities that every person could walk into a store and take whatever they needed and fill out a receipt, an inventory slip, and say, I've just taken out such and such XYZ amount of food so that the society and the state planners could replenish the shelves. But in other words, the, the role of money stops to have any social significance, in fact, has no significance, but that's based on an evolutionary post-socialist uh, process whereby social norms, cultural norms uh, are reinforced that emphasize human need and human cooperation, and the institutions of violence, like the police, the courts, the prisons, are no longer necessary, are antiquated institutions, because Right now, they're designed basically for social control of oppressed classes and oppressed people. And if all the people in society have what they need to live, then the issues of 
say, social misconduct or whatever can be handled by the community rather than by state coercive but, but, institutions. But Brian, come on, man. We hear we hear Rudy Giuliani on TV all the time now saying this. And of course, if he is saying it, it must be true that the only reason that 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 in this that black people are over policed is because that's where all the crime is. And this idea that people could could exist without police and could exist. I mean, you know, that there's always this element usually described as black or brown. Uh, but but there's always an element of all societies that, that we're told they're just going to be criminals. How yeah, can we, and, how and that's can we one of the important that? contributions of Marxism is to show that 95% of our existence, of our historical existence as a species, when we were all the indigenous peoples of all the continents, we lived without police, we lived without jails, we lived without a, a courts, we lived without instruments of alienated violence and coercion to, quote, police the people. In other words, society was based on equality. The human race lived largely as communists until the development of class society, where some parts of the population grabbed hold of the surplus and were able to use that surplus for economic and political power and then transferred it to their male uh, children. Uh, in other words, the rise of patriarchy. We have to look at the human race and see, well, guess what? For the most of our existence as a species, which means it must be part of human nature, we could live in cooperation. Certainly under communism, this using the advance, advances in science and technology and industry, uh, those advances allow society to do away with hunger and want, which is the most important thing so that human beings can live can recreate, can educate themselves, can have social and cultural institutions without having to live in a dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, individualistic environment. Well, and those uh, looking forward to in, the, in the coming weeks to supporting and celebrating Dr. King should remember that one of the things he was calling for at the end of his life was a guaranteed annual income that specifically, as he said, would be designed to, to reduce the stress on working people that leads to, to criminal activity. So I don't know. Maybe you were onto something there. I don't know. Uh, and Dr. King was a socialist. Yeah, he absolutely was. And people want to to ignore that uh, and downplay that and make movies that don't talk about that. But 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 right. you know that's another conversation. Well, can I can I say one <laughs> yeah, really please, quick thing? Please, too? please, please go ahead. Yeah, because because as you know, and I wrote the book Shackled and Chained about prisons. I mean, it's it's very interesting to me. I mean, all problems have solutions, and it, the only thing that we ever talk about in our society, everyone says, let's cure cancer, let's cure AIDS, let's get rid of poverty. The only thing that's ever talked about from the point of view of, well, we could never solve that is crime. And I think that honestly, we have to look one level deeper. And this is one of those things that maybe is a little more anecdotal at why that's the one issue, because it's the one issue that speaks, in my view, most directly to the idea that these conflicts that exist in our society are social conflicts, not individual, not, you know, uh, uh, some result of racist or some like you're a black, so you must be a criminal or whatever the justification is. These things speak so heavily to the divisions in our society as being essentially, even though they are very real, essentially being socially created and being things that were created and thus can go away. And I think ultimately, you know, we can have phones that are like computers and send, you know, uh, rovers to catch on to satellites to study tiny little particles of water and somehow we can't figure out how to all live together. I mean, it's completely absurd, except when you look at it in terms of the broader significance of what it would start to say about our society when we started to say, OK, well, what are the reasons? Even if you say someone committed a crime because of mental illness, that's a reason, not a random thing. So if these are the reasons things are happening, these are the solutions. And we're going to start to see that we're going to the root of our society and uprooting a system that benefits a tiny group of people, but a tiny group who have a lot of power. And ultimately, I think that's why this issue of struggling against you know prisons and racist police oppression oftentimes has the ability to be so explosive, as we've seen time and again. Now, you know, uh, right after uh, Obama was elected the first time and, and uh, 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 a woman claiming socialism or communism or maybe both told me that that my refusal to support his candidacy from the beginning uh, was due to my dialectics being broken. That's a direct quote. <laughs> she said she said, Jared, your dialectics are broken. How do you both understand historical dialectical materialism? And again, we only have a few few minutes for this, but but in in, in a short summary, how do you understand the, that approach to the world, and how does that help us get to the root of these these problems? And and what was wrong with mine that I could not have supported Obama in either of these elections? 
Well, there was nothing oh, wrong with yours. Uh, I think it was only wrong with, with hers. But I'm sorry, Brian, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say she's the one who uh, perhaps should check her dialectics, which actually doesn't really fully speak to her point. But I think the way we understand it is, you know, sort of dialectical materialism is the understanding of really sort of the interconnectedness of things and how, you know, phenomenon, both social phenomenon and natural physical phenomenon oftentimes are the result of the interaction and contradiction and movement of different forces that presuppose each other, that in their their dynamic interaction, they're creating and driving things. And so from the point of view of historical materialism, it's the idea that ultimately the underlying struggle between social groups to determine uh, uh, how the society is going to be set up is in fact the broad motor force that those sort of contradictions and 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 uh, and, and interplay between those two fa- the, these different factors are what drives forward the historical process and materialist because it's based on the actual view of things, not just sort of the theoretical practice, but understanding these th- this theory as being an elucidation of the actual phenomenon. Uh, in society and in the natural world, even if it's a level deeper. So that's a little brief capsule thing. Brian, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say, you know, in the Bible, the first words are, in the beginning, there was the word, the word of God. And that from that word of God, human society, first Adam and Eve, but through the whole Genesis, the rest of society was created. As materialists, as historical materialists, we would turn that formula upside down and say, First, there is existence. First, there is human existence and natural existence. And the way people live and how they live socially and how they interact shapes their ideas. And their ideas, in turn, create God. Their ideas create all sorts of political, religious, cultural notions. But those ideas don't fall from the skies. They don't fall from heaven They come about even if human beings are not aware exactly of how and why their ideas are being formed, they come about because of their environment. And so when we look at contradictions in society and the contradictions that propel motion, propel conflict and then uh, solutions, they come from within society, not because of our notions of society, not because of our ideas about how things are or how things should be but because of the living struggle of people. And so the United States government teaches our children every day when they put their hand on their heart to say pledge of allegiance uh, to the flag, to a a society that brings uh, justice and liberty for all. They're inculcating a form of idealism, I would say a reactionary, untrue, false idealism uh, amongst our young people. And we want young people to look at society for the way it really is and then to say, The way it really is, you have vast parts of society living in poverty, vast parts that are in prison, vast parts that are underpaid, vast parts of society that can hardly go to college because uh, tuition makes education a privilege instead of a right, and that this problem isn't because of them, it's not because of bad ideas, it's because of a social and economic system that allocates power and privilege to, to the few instead of to the majority. And so materialism has a revolutionary outcome once people are liberated and able to see society as it really is and then come to their own conclusions about how change can be brought about. That's Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier for the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm Jared Ball. This is I Mix What I Like for IMixWhatILike.org and WPFW 89.3 FM. Shout out, of course, also to RapStation.com. We'll be back in just a, a quick minute and wrap up our conversation with again Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier in the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Don't go anywhere, coming right back. I mix what I like, WPFW 89.3 FM. Peace. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. Again, I'm Jared Ball. I mix what I like.org for more at I Mix What I Like for all your relevant social media. We're joined again in wrapping up this, for me at least, a great conversation uh, with Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and we thank them very much for joining us. In this in this last few minutes that we have, gentlemen, um, I'll ask you to wrap up any way you like, but I did want to ask you specifically about the ways you all address these issues. That I, you know, I think of, even in this brief conversation, you've made a compelling case, um, uh, certainly to me, a reasonable case, though I was already somewhat converted, for the need for this kind of radical change in our society, structural change in our society, that socialism 
uh, is not a bad word, is, is something that uh, is even to be aspired to, as is communism. Um, I'm wondering, you know, first, you, 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 well, once I, I once upon a time asked this question of one of your comrades, uh, I believe Yari Osorio, Yari Osorio running for, I believe at the time, vice president uh, on your party's ticket. Uh, and I asked, you know, this question about comparing what you all were doing with electoral politics and what, what I had been involved in at one point with the Green Party and wondering why those two efforts and efforts like that didn't sort of unify and join and blah, 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 blah. And the res- response I got was a good one, that yours was the only uh, uh, campaign, electoral political campaign that, that, that addressed itself as a socialist movement, one that was looking to end capitalism and offer an alternative, uh, whereas even ours within the Green Party was not that much of a break. Uh, so I want to ask you all about your approach to electoral politics, the value as you see it in in running these these campaigns that, as we're always told, can't win, will never win, are, you know, are useless and a waste of time, etc. cetera. Um, and then beyond that, because I know also that voting is not your central means for, for bringing about change. Uh, Brian, I'll start with you. How do you all see electoral politics as a role uh, or in playing a role in, in, this, in this kind of change? And then what beyond that uh, do you all advocate and, and, and any other concluding comments you would want to make? Sure. And I'll, I'll try to do it quickly. The, we don't see the electoral arena as a fundamental a place for change. Uh, people have had an opportunity to witness uh, the change from Bush and Cheney to Obama and the Democrats in 2009, where the Democrats had control of the House, the Senate, and the and the presidency. And here, eight years later, the conditions of life are are very bad and getting worse for big sections of the working class. And 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 the wars and the drone strikes and targeted assassinations continue. Uh, the electoral system has been crafted by the capitalist ruling class so as to maintain its power to give the illusion of democracy, uh, to let people choose every two or four years who's going to oppress them for the next two or four years. So uh, it's a very limited expression of democracy or, or maybe the, the antithesis of, of, of democracy. But we run candidates because the attention of the masses of people is drawn into the electoral arena invariably every two or four years. And we want to get in and compete with the ideas of the capitalists who are you know, transmitted through the capitalist politicians of both parties. In other words, it's a kind of way of doing political battle, a battle of ideas, even though it's a very limited arena because it's so undemocratic. Uh, in terms of the Green Party uh, PSL, we Eugene just ran uh, for D.C. Council at large as a Green Party statehood party candidate, even right. though he's also a member of the PSL and That's a right. socialist. So we see a great prospect for a red-green uh, red, green, black alliance. In other words, we want to look for electoral alliances. We recognize that all of the political parties and organizations of the left uh, need allies, need to be working together, need to conduct themselves in a way that's uh, that's civil, that's comradely. In other words, to do common battle against a common foe. And if we can do so in the electoral arena, we're very we're very interested in pursuing different opportunities. You know, I'm glad you said that. In fact, when we were trying to do our campaign in, in 07, 08, uh, that was, in fact, what we were saying. We wanted to change the Green Party into a red, black and green party. And uh, I think for some of the reasons we've already covered in this conversation, it didn't go over as well as your efforts uh, have. Uh, uh, but that is. Anyway, that was where we were going. Eugene, right. please. Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny because I was smiling as, as you guys were talking because I remember actually hearing you talk, Jared, uh, promoting uh, Congresswoman McKinney's campaign and using that exact phrase. So uh, good to hear that again. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that ultimately, you know, the elections, everything Brian said is true. The opportunity it provides us and also the chance to get a sense to see uh, – you know, there's larger numbers of people out there who favor these radical solutions than you think, especially since the elections, uh, you know, don't even represent all people. It sort of represents an interesting slice of individuals who are in a particular frame that may be, you know, at least ostensibly more uh, uh, favorable to bourgeois politics, but are still willing to be open to revolutionary politics. I think when you start to see those numbers, even if they're relatively small, they become more significant when you look at, uh, you know, how we conceive the size of our movement and our influence. And I think that ultimately, you know, when we're pulling together a, a, a real coalition of people that can that can start to fan the flames of, of rebellion and really start to fight back. These are some of the forces that were just mentioned that have the ability to do it. So ultimately, I guess that's how I would conclude is I think that we're in an extremely uh, pregnant moment. I think as Brian was alluding to earlier, I mean, I would say pr- maybe the two periods with the most 
sort of revolutionary upsurge and fervor in America have been ones, the Civil War and then later the Civil Rights Revolution and slash Black Power Movement, however you want to describe it, where the the motion of African-American people coming into struggle for their own national liberation has set in train much broader, much more significant, deeper changes and challenges to the system as a whole. And so here we are in this new particular moment. And I think more than ever, we need to start raising the idea, not just of, re- of, of protesting something, not just of resisting something, but moving our protests and our resistance towards a final goal, which is to challenge for power. There is a tiny less than 1% of elites who control all the power in the world who are you know providing and presiding over poverty hunger war exploitation and oppression and we have to eliminate move those people to the side and put the broad mass of people in power if we want to pursue any of these solutions and we have to start to look at our protests as our resistance as a struggle for power to put in place a new system that ends this oppression and we think that's socialism all right well gentlemen i greatly appreciate you taking the time and offering up these uh, great ideas and alternatives and look folks if you're going to go back to the democratic party after eight years of obama and you see where we are now i mean i don't mean to speak ill of your intelligence level but come on man i mean this is ridiculous you know what I'm <laughs> Uh, Brian Becker, Eugene Perrier, thank you very much for joining us here at I Mix What I Like. We appreciate your your work. No, we appreciate your work and we want to continue to support it. PSLweb.org or rather liberationnews.org, liberationradio.org. Again, shout out to Ernesto. Keep up the good work, good people. uh, And and I appreciate your time. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. If people want to uh, get information about joining the party, you can do that on the website at liberationnews.org. A lot of people sign up and join or apply for membership all over the country. If you like what you heard, uh, check us out. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.